morning. Uh, welcome to our Bible teaching this morning from Philippians. I think this is the fifth one in the series. Um, and we're getting a lot of uh, good stuff in Philippians. I think we've uh, listened with great interest to um, what everyone else has got to say. So I've got a really good passage to, um, to open up to you this morning. So I hope you um, enjoy it and I hope you um, comment and, and, uh, and, and engage with what I'm going to say. Um, my theme is trusting in God. Um, and really it's about trusting God in all circumstances. So that's a really useful one for us to put in our pack, our pack of the Christian life. So I'll start by reading. I'm going to start at verse 18. My official line is from 19 um, to 26. I should say this is chapter one, um, but I'm going to cheat a little bit by just leading up to my passage by reading 18 as well. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. That's the end of the passage. OK, so if you want to check that later, Philippians 1 from 18 to 26. Right. I've got quite a lot to say about this, but it's I just think it's full of, of, of exuberance and, and it's full of joy. The whole thing is, is lit up by his uh, the way he's written it is speed and and the movement of the of the words is quite excited so I did read it in quite an excited way um, so I'm looking at it um, picking about at little bits of it I'm going to bring out quite a few of the themes that we've already had um, one is mainly about how to live the Christian life and like I say today is all about trusting in God but another one is something that uh, Clive brought out last week please take Paul as an example of how to live a Christian life. And that was something that um, Clive examined last week. And I think we've got another example of it here, that here is Paul in a great of uh, great suffering, great distress, because he's actually in prison. He is, he is chained to a Roman guard at all times. He cannot leave, he cannot do anything he wants to do without the Roman God being with him. I think we can assume he's on house arrest in Rome, um, but he, his freedom is completely curtailed. Um, and yet he sounds like he's full of rejoicing and happiness. So I'm going to consider this passage as a bit of a sandwich. Um, and I'm going to go zoom into the middle bit. Um, we could call this the meat of the passage. And it I slowed the passage down for you to hear that message in verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right, I'm going to come back to that quite a few times. That's something for us maybe even to learn. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a challenge in that verse. So like I say, I'm thinking of it as a sandwich um, and it's a, a joy sandwich. Um, the bread is the joy. So right at the beginning, um, I started at verse 18, um, just leading on to 19. 
Christ is preached and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So that sounds full of joy. And that's the beginning of the passage. At the end of the passage, we've got, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So it's a joy sandwich. Um, and the Christian life should be full of joy. So I'm going to take a moment to just sidetrack a little bit and talk about joy, because I think, and possibly I think other people will say this as well, Philippians is one of the joyful, most joyful books in the Bible. It is absolutely steeped in joy. Um, and I just checked this out because I thought it was uh, like a common theme. I checked it out and it says, joy or rejoicing, those two words, is mentioned 16 times. 16 times, but in only 104 verses. So I didn't do my ratio, but it does sound like an awful lot of joy for quite a short book of the Bible. So, um, the important thing, let's have a look at 18. I think um, we did get this from Clive last week. The, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So Paul's message is, let's proclaim the gospel. Let me proclaim the gospel if I can, where I am. But all of you guys, wherever you are, proclaim the gospel. The gospel brings joy. And like I said, we've got the contrast. We know that this passage is excited. It, it's full of ex exhilaration. You know, these words of, of um, enthusiasm. Um, and yet we've got the contrast that Paul is actually suffering at this moment. And Paul is rejoicing because he is in prison. Because he is in prison, the gospel is being preached. And because of what has happened to him, and because of the prayers of the Philippians, he will have courage to go on living for Christ. And that is his hope, that he will carry on to preach the gospel to all the people that need to hear the gospel. This isn't the sort of joy we think about when we think of joy. We often think of joy equaling happiness. Happiness is feelings of pleasure, perhaps um, a sunny day, a, a, a f some flowers, got some flowers here, um, pink flowers. And um, it could be lots of things. It could be a new job, a new house, all sorts of things bring us pleasure. But let's think again very closely on this. These sort of happiness are transitory. They don't last for very long, but joy is much deeper. So I borrowed um, Nick's book, one of his books by Tom Wright. This is a great book because it's really simple understanding these letters, um, Philippines and the other letters that Paul wrote in prison. Um, so I'm going to quote a little bit from Tom Wright about rejoicing. Rejoicing in the Lord means having Jesus Christ as our Lord, Saviour and treasure. Now, I liked the word treasure. I thought that really stood out for me. Treasure is something you can keep, keep forever even. Back to Tom Wright. He gives us deeper, sweeter and purer, more lasting pleasure and gladness than anything this world has to offer. I'll say that again. He gives us deeper sweeter, purer, more lasting pleasure and gladness than anything this world has to offer. And that brought me on to another little bit of Philippians. I don't think we've had this before. Philippians 3 verse 8. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So Paul just puts Jesus first, last, middle, the whole thing. And that brings us to how Jesus should be for you. Knowing Jesus is not an add-on. Add-on. Not an add-on. Um, it's not someone to add on to what we have already, our friends, our family, our home, our, things that we enjoy in life. He is not an add-on. He is the centre of our lives. He is an all in all. And, right, so this leads us right on to that bit I want you to remember. 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. What a statement, what a challenge, what a challenge to us. Is it true for me? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain? Wow. Now, the reason I chose this passage is because this, this particular verse really resonates with me. Um, now, I first came across this verse. Here's a little story for you. I first came across this verse when I had a summer job as a waitress in ross on -Sea when I was 16 at a Christian Endeavour holiday camp. Um, I believed I was a Christian. I was baptised, confirmed, went to church regularly, prayed. Um, but this came up as a bit of a surprise for me. In the evening we had entertainment, sometimes a bit Christian, sometimes a bit general. Um, one night a group of the waitresses um, were all going to sing a song from Youth Praise. Uh, I don't know if you remember Youth Praise from the uh, 70s, early 70s, maybe 60s. And this was the song, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To hold his hand and walk his narrow way. There is no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, I didn't look this up when I, I wrote it out, so I wouldn't forget it right now. But I didn't look it up uh, because after nearly 50 years, these words have stayed with me. And these words were a challenge to me then, as now, still a challenge. Was I prepared to die for Jesus? How could I ever have that faith that I saw among the other waitresses I was working with and um, spending all my time with? Um, lovely, um, mainly Irish girls with a very shining faith, a shining faces singing how for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I realised that they actually really loved Jesus. He was at the centre of their lives. And I found that a little frightening. It says, doesn't it, in the Bible, that the word of God can pierce our souls. And it says in Hebrews 4, verse 12, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And that passage, even though it was a song, I knew it was from the Bible, such a challenge for me to put Jesus first at the centre, not an add-on, but an all-in-all. All. So let's step back a little bit from that centre verse. What is Philippians about? Philippians gives us lots of guidance on what the Christian life should look like. And like I said, Paul appears to be at his most relaxed in this letter. He seems to be quite enjoying himself. He seems to have a really good relationship with the Philippian church that he's talking to. But let's have a look. Here is Paul in prison. While he is in prison, imagine this, he does not know what's going to happen next. He does not know if he's going to trial or if he's going to be condemned to death. He does not know if he's going to be released. And Paul is talking about the possibility that he will be put to death for the sake of the gospel. Now, I was using my imagination. What would I be like in that situation? How would I feel? I'm afraid I would feel a little bit self-pitying. I would feel a little bit, oh, poor me. Uh, maybe a bit defensive. I haven't done anything wrong. Why, why have they done this to me? I might feel a bit critical of the Roman powers. How dare they treat me this way? But we don't see this in Paul, do we? We see the exact opposite. Look at the way he uses his words. Look at the way he uses the words eagerly. Let's look at verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but we'll have sufficient courage. We'll stop there for a bit. Oh, and Christ will be exalted. Look at those words. Like I say, they're full of excitement and anticipation. He eagerly expects that God will do his will in the situation that he's in right now. 
It's amazing, isn't it? If, if only we could have faith like this. And look at his style, the way he jumps about. Let's have a look here. Um, where are we? Um, chapter, uh, verse 22. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. That's amazing. Again, he sounds really bright and breezy. It almost makes us forget what he's saying, but he's saying, shall I live or shall I die? And he considers them both in detail, but he considers that both are good options. Both of them are good. To die is better by far, it says, as he will be with Christ. And yet he thinks it might be better for the others, the Philippians, if he carries on living. But not for his own sake, but for the sake of those people that he ministers to. So just a little bit of a parenthesis, I'm going to say. Um, he doesn't talk about going to heaven, and that's just a little side issue for us to think about. Um, we certainly have a lot of muddled thinking in our um, land in our world right now about what happens after we die and Paul throughout his letters does not say anything about going to heaven what he knows about death is that he will be with Christ and he has confidence that he is in Christ's hands whatever happens when he says yet what shall I choose he implies it's his own choice, but we know it's not his choice, and he knows too. He knows his life is in God's hands. Whether he lives or die, he is in God's hands. Can we have this confidence that we are in God's hands, whatever happens? And like I say, my sermon today is about trusting in God, and it's trusting in God in all circumstances. Um, it's good to trust in God when things are going well, when we feel generally happy with the way things are going in our lives. But it's trusting in God when things are not going well, when we are suffering and when things are going against us. That's when we test, when we really trust in God. Let's look right at the end of the passage. I'll quote a little bit of Tom Wright because I can't resist it. A little bit of Tom Wright. Um, let's look right at the end. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And Tom Wright says, Paul is full of life and energy and quite ready to get back to work the minute they let him out of prison. He wants this for your progress and joy in the faith. There we are. That word joy. The other side of the sandwich. Joy. Your joy in the faith. And another bit that stuck out for me right at the end, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. He wants his life to be in God's service so that other people will have an abounding and overflowing of love and of joy in Christ too. And abounding is a lovely word of overflowing of spilling out into general life, into other people. Um, and it reminded me of that verse that I think Nick preached uh, two weeks ago, uh, verse nine. Um, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So we, we need to have abounding love, abounding joy, abounding faith. And this can happen if we make Jesus the absolute centre of our lives. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's hold on to those words. Whatever happens, God is in control. We can trust in God. Amen. <laughs>